thank you everyone for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, R Street is a, a center-right think tank that uh, promotes uh, free markets and real solutions. Um, within the governance program, we deal with all sorts of questions, um, but primarily organized around this theme of uh, trying to make the government work better. So uh, improving how the, uh, uh, the legislative branch operates, improving oversight over the executive branch, um, improving you know, uh, the budget process and things of this nature. And so uh, our discussion today is about a book that I think is, uh, has a lot to add to this conversation. Uh, it's called Free to Move. Uh, and uh, with us today is the, uh, the author of that book, um, Ilya Soman. Um, Ilya is the professor, professor of law at George Mason University and the author of three books, uh, Free to Move, the, the most recent, but uh, also um, uh, Democracy and Political Ignorance uh, and The Grasping Hand uh, about Hilo and the uh, reverse of the city of New London decision. Um, Ilya is also a regular contributor to the very well-known uh, Vola Conspiracy uh, law and politics blog hosted by Reason. So, uh, Ilya, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to you and the R Street Institute for arranging this event. Uh, I'm actually, it happens, the author of six books. Uh, oh. it just, those are the three uh, most relevant to today's talk. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just take a very few minutes to outline the basic thesis of my book, and then I look forward to your questions and those of the audience. Uh, so uh, the book came out in 2020. Uh, ironically, it came out right around the time uh, when uh, many of us were in lockdown, even as I came out with a book on the virtues of freedom of movement. So I hope that awful experience might lead more people to appreciate some of those virtues. Uh, and the core idea of the book uh, is to challenge the assumption that the best way and often the only way that we can exercise political choice is at the ballot box when we choose who to vote for, for president or for other political offices. Instead, I suggest that we often have uh, better and more effective political freedom when we vote with our feet. And there are three different ways that we can do that. One is by doing it in federal systems and we decide what state or local government to live under. Another is in the private sector. Uh, there are many types of private sector organizations that provide services similar to those of governments, particularly state or local governments, uh, and that's another option uh, for foot voting. And third, most controversially, through international migration, uh, where people can and when they're allowed to do so often do choose to live in one country rather than another, often because they prefer the government policies in the destination countries. Uh, and uh, in the book, I outline two important advantages uh, that foot voting has over ballot box voting as a mechanism of political choice. The first is that foot voters tend to be better informed. When you vote at the ballot box uh, in most elections, you have only an infinitesimally small chance of casting a vote that actually makes a difference to the outcome. In an American presidential election, it's about a one in 60 million chance. In a state or local election, it might be considerably higher, uh, but still very low. In most contexts, we would not say you have meaningful freedom or meaningful choice if you have only a one in 60 million chance or even a one in one million chance of influencing the outcome. For example, we wouldn't say you have meaningful religious freedom if you have only a one in one million chance of being able to determine what faith you want to practice or whether you want to practice one at all. I would suggest that political freedom works much the same way. A one in one million chance of making a difference is just not much in the way of political freedom at all. Secondly, precisely because there is so little chance of influencing the outcome, when people vote at the ballot box, uh, they have very little incentive to acquire relevant information about what's going on or what the choices before them are. Uh, and uh, indeed, it's actually rational to spend little time and effort acquiring information relevant to such a decision. And as I discuss in this book, and somewhat more in my previous book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, which uh, 
uh, Jonathan mentioned, overwhelming evidence shows that most voters, in fact, know very little about the political issues that are at stake uh, when they vote in elections. For example, often they don't even know basic things such as which party controls which House of Congress uh, or what the federal government spends its money on, or even the names of the three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Uh, foot voting is superior to ballot box voting on both of these dimensions. Uh, when you choose where you live in a federal system or when you vote with your feet in the private sector or through international migration, if you're allowed to do it at all, that is a choice that is highly likely to make a real difference with respect to the policies that you have to live under. Uh, it's actually like a decision where you really can decide what church or synagogue or mosque you want to attend or whether you want to attend one at all. Uh, so precisely for that reason, when people vote with their feet, they also have better incentives to be informed. Uh, they do so because that choice is one that's highly likely to make a difference. If you're like most people, you probably spend more time and effort seeking out information uh, when you decide what kind of television set to buy than when you vote in an election for president or for any other political office. That's not because the team TV is more important than who governs the country uh, or that it makes more complicated decisions or a decision is inherently more complicated there. It's because you know that when you choose a TV, the one you pick is highly likely to end up in your living room. But when you turn on the TV and you have the misfortune to see the president or some other pol powerful politician, you know that your odds of affecting who that person is are extremely low. So you take that decision much less seriously, most likely. And spend much less time acquiring information about it. For the same reason, uh, when people vote at the ballot box, they also make relatively little effort to constrain their biases. Uh, so it's not just a matter of they acquire less information, they also do a poorer job of evaluating it than when they vote with their feet. And as I discuss in the book, uh, there's enormous evidence, uh, both historical and experimental, that when people vote with their feet, they seek out more information and use it more wisely uh, than when they vote at the ballot box. And these advantages of foot voting over ballot box voting translate into superiorities uh, with respect to a wide range of theories of political freedom. So I myself, I admit I'm a libertarian, but uh, this book is not based on any kind of distinctively libertarian premises. Uh, these advantages of foot voting over ballot box voting translate into superiority under a wide range of theories of political choice and political freedom and participation, including those advanced by various uh, distinctively non-libertarian and left of center scholars of various kinds. I'm happy to talk about that in the question. Uh, so just briefly on the three types of foot voting, one is uh, foot voting in a federal system. Uh, and uh, historically, millions of Americans and people around the world have voted with their feet in federal systems. Uh, in the book, I describe ways in which this is actually a particular boon to the poor and disadvantaged, and also ways that we can break down some of the barriers to mobility that have grown up in recent decades in the US, particularly with respect uh, to the poor racial minorities and other groups that often are especially in need of it. I also discuss in some detail foot voting in the private sector, which is a less familiar idea than foot voting within federal systems, but nonetheless, it's an extremely important phenomenon. Uh, we have many private organizations that provide services similar to those traditionally provided by state or local governments. The most obvious are private planned communities like condominiums, homeowners associations, and others. Uh, already some 74 million Americans live in these kind of organizations. It's not true that it's just a small elite of wealthy people that can take advantage of this. But in the book, I describe how we can expand this and other forms of private sector foot voting to make them more available to the poor and others who have less access to them now. And I also describe how often this actually offers greater freedom of choice and greater improvements in quality of government than is available through foot voting in federal systems at all, uh, in federal systems alone. 
Uh, finally, there is foot voting through international migration. Uh, for well-known reasons, this is the most controversial type. Uh, Anti-immigration political movements have arisen in recent years in both Europe and the United States. Uh, nonetheless, this is also the type of foot voting with the biggest potential gains. The reason for that is because uh, if you think about the difference between uh, whatever you think is the best governed American state and whatever you think is the worst, uh, it might be a significant difference, but it's small compared to the difference between, say, the U.S. and Cuba, or the U.S. and Zimbabwe, or the U.S. and Venezuela, and numerous other countries that have uh, oppressive, unjust, corrupt, and other and other otherwise highly uh, harmful governments. Uh, so when people can shift from one of these regimes to the U.S. or another Western liberal democracy, uh, that right away is a life transforming thing for them. A tremendous increase in their political freedom and indeed in many, most other kinds of freedom as well. It also results in truly enormous economic gains to the point where economists estimate that if we had free migration throughout the world, uh, world GDP would double. Uh, later in the book, I go through a variety of objections to expanded freedom of movement and foot voting. Uh, here, I'll just note the two broad categories of objections. One consists of theories that uh, governments have an inherent right to exclude, uh, either because a particular part of the world belongs, quote unquote, to a particular racial or ethnic group, such as that France belongs to ethnically French people, for instance, or alternatively, there are theories that analogize governments and their powers to those of homeowners or private club members who it is argued have the right to exclude people from their homes or their property for any reason they want. Uh, and uh, I criticize both of these types of theories for a general right to exclude on a wide range of grounds. I'm happy to go through these in questions. Uh, there's also a second class of reasons why people criticize uh, freedom of movement or argue it should be limited. Uh, and that is the idea that if you permit it or you permit too much of it, there will be various harmful side effects, such as immigrants potentially increasing crime, overburdening the welfare state, becoming bad voters and voting for horrible politicians. If you get too many of the wrong kinds of immigrant voters, I know it's hard to believe, but they might vote for a president uh, who has no regard for liberal democratic norms. And if he lose an election, uh, uh, he might refuse to admit defeat and instead instigate violence to uh, uh, reverse the result. Uh, so uh, despite uh, my attempt at flippancy there, I do take that and other objections seriously. I can't go through all the answers in this presentation, but I'll merely note the general framework uh, that I use to address these kinds of objections. I want to ask three questions. First, how big a problem is it really? Uh, often it turns out that it's not much of a problem at all. For example, in the US, far from increasing the crime rate, immigrants actually have much lower crime rates than native born Americans. Uh, but second, let's say there is a problem, and I admit sometimes there is, uh, then you have to ask, is there a keyhole solution? A keyhole solution is what scholars refer to uh, when there is a way to address negative side effects of immigration by means less draconian and less harmful uh, than excluding the people entirely. And there are a wide range of keyhole solutions for a wide range of problems. Finally, as I mentioned before, uh, we should ask uh, that uh, whether maybe the enormous new wealth created by freer migration can be used to offset some of its negative side effects if there is no other way to do it. Uh, and there are many ways that we can do that potentially for some uh, types of problems that have been posited. So when you go through these three questions and address the three issues rigorously, I think it will turn out the cases where migration restrictions are justified uh, are going to be extremely rare. In the last part of the book, I talk about uh, how the institutional design of both domestic constitutions and also international law can be structured in ways uh, that increase opportunities for foot voting, but also uh, increase uh, ways to deal with possible negative side effects. And I'm happy again to talk about that in questions. I should also mention that the revised edition of my book came out just last month and is now available on Amazon and uh, other fine electronic booksellers near you. Uh, that book includes several issues 
that were not in the original edition. Most notably, it addresses the argument that we need to limit migration in order to uh, combat the COVID pandemic or to prevent the spread of other diseases. Uh, I also address the issue uh, that uh, there, if we have too much migration, we might create backlash by illiberal political movements, uh, and that can threaten liberal democracy. Ironically, this argument says not that the immigrants themselves are a threat to liberal democracy, but rather uh, the harmful reactions or potentially harmful reactions by natives to immigration, that that might be a threat. That was not in the original edition, but it should be. Uh, it should have been, it is in the new edition. The new edition also has a section on the impact of widespread remote work uh, on uh, opportunities for foot voting. Uh, remote work existed before the COVID pandemic, but obviously has become much more extensive uh, since then. Uh, so much more can be said, but for now I'll conclude and uh, I look forward to Jonathan's questions and also those of the audience. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I will mention one small thing uh, additionally, which is that 50% uh, of all the royalties generated by this book, both the first edition and the revised one, uh, I have pledged to give them to uh, charities benefiting refugees, many of whom sadly during the COVID crisis are even worse off than they are uh, at other times. Thank you. Well, that's great. Uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, overview. So, so thank you for that. Um, and just a, a quick note before I ask a question, which is that for anyone else who does have questions, there is the Q and A box. Um, so feel free to uh, put your questions in there, and uh, I will I will take them as we go along. Um, I want to go back to something you said in the beginning, and sort of you know talk about this comparison between the ballot box and sort of and and foot voting. Um, you know, you made a point that I think many viewers might disagree with, which is that, you know, we spend a lot more time thinking about our, our what TV we're going to put in our living room than we do, uh, you know, the president that's going to appear on that TV. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who would, who would actually disagree with that statement, right? I mean, people spend a lot of time thinking about um, who they're going to vote for or politics or so on. And there may be sort of, you know, uh, heuristics like party ID, for example, that people use as a way to, you um, you know, decide, but I think there are there are still obviously the number of, of uh, independents, uh, registered independents is in increasing. Uh, so, you know, that says that perhaps people are, um, you know, not as tied to these kind of old heuristics as they as they might have been in the past. So um, I, I wonder if I can push back a little bit on that and maybe, you know, also um, have you talk a little bit more about um, the these two tools, right? Because I think that if I if I could be critical of the book, and this is a, a very small critique, I would say that, you know, I don't necessarily think that there is a, a trade-off per se between change affected by the ballot box and change from, uh, you know, freedom of movement or, or, or voting with your feet. And so, um, you know, I wonder if, um, I mean, do you think that there's some sort of, um, do, you, do, you, do you have an implicit assumption maybe that, that you know, uh, if you could pick one, you would only pick voting with your feet um, or, what is sort of the the interplay between those two those two um, you know mechanisms for change and how how can they maybe better um, uh, exist side by side? Yeah, so there are I think at least three important questions there. Let me try to take them in order. One is: Is it really true that? people devote less time and effort to learning about politics and about foot voting decisions. And I think it depends to some extent on the person, but for the vast majority of people, the answer is yes. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, because uh, all kinds of data over many years show that the vast majority of people often don't even know very basic things about politics and public policy, uh, such as uh, which party controls which House of Congress, what the three branches of government are, uh, how the federal government spends its money, which politicians and political leaders are responsible for which issues, and many, many, many other things that I can go through and in fact do go through somewhat in this book and even more so in my previous book, Democracy and Political Ignorance. Uh, I think this is sometimes hard to understand for people like you and me, and perhaps many of those watching uh, this, uh, you know, this program, in that uh, people like that disproportionately come from the minority that's highly interested in politics and follows it closely. Uh, but we, for the most part, are not a representative group. Uh, I 
analogize my previous book, Such People, to people who are highly committed sports fans and know all the sports statistics. And, you know, if they're baseball fans, they know Sabre metrics and the details of, you know, statistical measurement of uh, marginal contribution of particular players and so forth. Those people definitely exist, but they're a relatively small proportion of the population. The same thing is true of what I call political fans, people who follow politics very closely and know a lot about government policy. I would add that being a political fan, while it makes you more knowledgeable in general than uh, most people who aren't political fans, it also on average makes you more biased. That is, uh, people who are committed political fans, uh, like people who are committed sports fans of a particular team, uh, they tend to be very biased in their evaluation of information in favor of their team, quote unquote, versus the opposing team or the opposing political party. Uh, and so uh, there is this uh, problem of what scholars call rational irrationality. When you seek out information, not for the purpose of getting at the truth, but for the purpose of enhancing your fan experience or some other objective that's at odds with seeking out the truth, that is actually rational to be very biased in your evaluation of information. Uh, it enhances your fan experience, but it also impairs the quality of your judgment uh, about the issues that you vote on. Uh, the second question you raise is the issue of heuristics. Uh, what I usually when heuristics are raised in the context of discussions of political knowledge and ignorance, the argument is, well, you don't really need to know very much because you can use heuristics or some people call them information shortcuts to make up for your ignorance. In my book, and even more so in Democracy and Political Ignorance, I push back on that uh, because I point out often in order to use the heuristics effectively, you need uh, some pre-existing knowledge. So it's often say you don't need to know much about what's going on. You just need to know uh, whether things are going well or badly under the rule of the incumbents. And if things are going badly, you vote them out. And if things are going well, you, you, know, you vote to reelect them. I point out that before you can make a judgment about whether things are going well or badly, you need to know which issues the incumbents actually have the power to affect. Voters often don't know that. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, you often need you know, other uh, somewhat more sophisticated knowledge as well. And there are other problems with heuristics that I also point out in my work. Uh, your question may suggest, well, maybe if people are independent voters, uh, they're not relying on the heuristic so much, for instance, they don't have a sense of loyalty to a party or to a particular politician. Uh, to that, I would say a couple of things. One is, while the number of people who describe themselves as independents has increased over the last two or three decades, a large proportion of those independents are, in fact, people who tend to vote overwhelmingly for one of the major parties or another most of the time. So many of them are people who are motivated not so much by partisanship in the sense that they love their party, they're motivated by what scholars call negative partisanship, they hate the opposing party. Uh, so they're people who vote for the Republicans because they really hate the Democrats or vice versa. And that kind of hatred is not conducive in most cases to clear thinking about uh, the issues. And it's also compatible with a high degree of ignorance. Uh, people who are genuine swing voters, the data shows by the way that they tend to know the least uh, about the political issues. Uh, and uh, finally, there is the question of are foot voting and ballot box voting substitutes for each other, or can they actually perhaps be complements? That is, they can coexist together. Uh, and I think there's to some extent both are true. In order to facilitate foot voting, we often need to put constraints on the power of ballot box voting, for it, particularly constraints on the power to restrict mobility itself, whether it be mobility in a federal system or mobility through international migration, but also often constraints on the power of ballot box voters to constrain the private sector, which offers many uh, useful foot voting options, or would at least in many cases if uh, it wasn't restricted or restricted. Nonetheless, I don't propose to abolish democratic government entirely. Uh, and then to that extent, there are, there are complements. And in the book, uh, I talk about how foot voting can in some respects create incentives for democratic governments to improve. Uh, for example, uh, governments that lose foot voters to other jurisdictions, if they have to raise their tax revenue from people within their territory then, and they want that tax revenue for various programs, that creates incentives uh, for them to improve. Uh, in my previous book, I also talk about how if we limit the power of democratic government, 
uh, and uh, more issues that are resolved by foot voting relative to ballot box voting, the issues that still remain within the domain of ballot box voting, because there are fewer of them, voters' attention is spread over fewer issues, and therefore political ignorance is not as harmful as it would be with a government where uh, ballot box voting controls more things. And there are some other potential synergies as well, some of which uh, I discuss in the book. Yeah, I think those are all those are all great points. I, I will say I am uh, I am very familiar with uh, you know with bias based on on sports teams. I know you're a New England sports fan, and I am a Yankees and Giants fan, so <laughs> I've seen plenty of that bias on your end. But <laughs> that's for another time, I think. Um, I want to so you know obviously you know since I run the governance program, I want to I want to focus our discussion a little bit on on some of these angles that relate to to governance issues and. You know, one of the I think things that everybody talks about is how how polarized society has become. Um, and uh, I think that an interesting question is, you know, what is the relationship in a sense between foot voting and polarization? Um, are there ways that you know, again, allowing this kind of freedom to move um, can can tamp down polarization? Because it does seem to me that the the opposite could very well also be true, which is that you know, to the degree that we have people who are moving or sorting themselves in different ways um, based on um, ideological or, or political differences that, you know, you end up getting at least in a, on an intra-country, you know, migratory basis, um, you end up exacerbating polarization where you have, you know, people who are, um, again, only around other people who are like them because they're sorting themselves in that way. And so do you see that as a, a negative impact or um, are there ways that, um, that again, we can, you know, maybe uh, improve upon the, the, the existing polarization by allowing uh, people to move or encouraging people to move? Yeah, so there are definitely theories that argue that if we have foot voting or at least we have too much of it, that exacerbates polarization. My view, which is not covered in this book, but which I do cover in a recent article in National Affairs that came out in September, is that expanding opportunities for foot voting can at least at the margin help reduce polarization. So first sort of the opposite, more pessimistic view, it's known as the big sort after a famous book by Bill Bishop, which has that, that name. And the idea is that if you, have too much foot voting, what you'll have is all of the conservatives moving to very red areas, all of the liberals moving to blue areas, and you'll have the conservatives living together all together and the, liber and the liberals living all together, they'd interact even less perhaps than they do now, and that will increase polarization. Uh, I think there's a couple of uh, problems with that thesis. Uh, one is, even when Republicans and Democrats do live in the same places, data suggests that most people don't spend much time discussing political issues with those who disagree, particularly those who have very deep disagreements. There are various reasons for that, such as that many people find it psychologically painful. And also, in many cases, it seems like there's a social norm that you're kind of giving offense if you criticize the other person's political views, and many people don't want to do that. Uh, secondly, when you look at migration patterns, Patterns, it turns out to be the case that much foot voting within the US is not actually foot voting of sort of the splits along right versus left lines, rather it often cuts across them. Uh, so often when people vote with their feet, the data shows that they prefer uh, relatively low taxes and low employment regulations, uh, which typically are often found in red states, but they also seem to like jurisdictions which are socially tolerant in various ways, which is more associated with blue areas uh, in some cases because they like the social tolerance for its own sake, in other cases, because social tolerance correlates with economic dynamism because various minorities uh, uh, that benefit from social tolerance, such as gays and lesbians, also uh, are contributors to economic development. And therefore, it doesn't seem to be the case that people make foot voting decisions along the kinds of crude right versus left or red versus blue lines uh, that we see uh, in uh, ballot box politics. Uh, and uh, I would add also that we often do see movement uh, from uh, blue areas to red areas and sometimes vice versa. So it's not the case that people move 
uh, to sort of more extreme versions of wherever they happen to start out. Uh, you know, they move to new areas and experiencing new areas and new policies can itself uh, broaden your outlook. Uh, so I think the big sword argument is at the very least greatly overblown. What's the opposite, more optimistic scenario? Uh, it's that if we expand opportunities for foot voting, one of the ways of doing so is by reducing the concentration of power in the federal government. Uh, and, you know, obviously it's harder to vote with your feet against the policy that's controlled by the federal government than one that's at the state or the local level. And I think one reason why we have so much polarization and partisan hostility and hatred is not the only reason, but one reason is that there's such immense concentration of power that has grown up in the federal government generally, but also in the presidency in particular, uh, that uh, people have great fear of what might happen if that power is controlled by the opposing political party. And that in turn uh, leads them to tolerate abuses by their own party that they might not tolerate to the same degree uh, if they had less fear of the opposition. Uh, with greater decentralization of power, uh, people might have less fear of what might happen if the White House or Congress or both were controlled by the opposing party. Uh, and with less fear of that kind, they might be more willing to crack down on abuses on their own side. Republicans perhaps would have been less tolerant of many of the things that Trump did, uh, and Democrats, you know, might police their own side more. And also there would be less sense that, you know, if the other side wins an election, it has to be illegitimate in some way, because it's just unacceptable uh, if they win. Again, I'm not saying this is the only uh, cause of polarization or that decentralizing power and foot voting uh, or expanding foot voting uh, is the, you know, by itself will solve all of our problems with polarization, but it could reduce them at the margin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the point about uh, the concentration of federal power is a good one, and, and it leads into a, a question that we got in the, in the chat box um, by Greg, who, uh, you know, gets to, um, you know, how much does, I guess, diversity of jurisdictions matter? So, so Greg says, you know, what can be done about allowing state lines to be redrawn in the U.S.? So, you know, West, Western Washington wants to, and Oregon want to join, or, you know, Idaho, with Idaho or something like this. Um, and, and, you know, to what degree, I guess, is that, um, is it necessary? And he asks, is, a, is there a grand compromise possible where both Republicans and Democrats get their additional reps or senators and we decentralize away from holding people in populations next to one another and, and siloed in states where they have nothing in common with, you know, a couple of urban centers. So um, do you think that, uh, I guess the question is how important is that? Would this, you know, would this increased flexibility make the U.S. more stable or maybe less polarized in the sense that you have people you know, sort of uh, sorting themselves, but they're more likely to be okay with interacting because they're more content with the, the you know, geographic locality and sort of the, the policies that are, that they are being governed by. So it's a good question that is partly addressed in the book, but partly I've talked about it in, you know, elsewhere. The part that I do address in the book is that I point out that when you decentralize power to a more local level, whether it be the, the level of local government or even better, the level of the private sector, there are more options that people have and also often lower moving costs. Other things equal, it's cheaper to move to another city or town in the same metro area where you are now than to move to another state entirely. And even cheaper sometimes to vote with your feet in the private sector, which you can often do even without physically moving. For example, if we have school choice, you can choose to send your kids to a different school without moving to a different jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, so that is discussed in the book. What is not discussed is the issue of sort of breaking up American states, but I do agree, and I've written up uh, elsewhere how it may well be desirable to break up some of the bigger ones to allow more foot voting and choice. Uh, and here, I think there is somewhat of a flaw in the Constitution, which makes it extremely difficult to break up existing states. You have to get both the consent of the state's legislature and that of Congress, which in the vast majority of instances is extraordinarily difficult uh, to do. Uh, if I remember correctly, it has not been done actually since the uh, secession of West Virginia from Virginia during the Civil War. And, you know, that involved, you know, some... 
uh, skullduggery or at least some very unusual circumstances such as that the official Virginia legislature was had you know voted to secede from the US and therefore those people weren't even participating in the process and the people in West Virginia set up what they said was the real state legislature even though there were only West Virginians there and then they in turn said we as the state legislature of all of Virginia uh, vote to approve the secession uh, of our part of the state which just happens to be the one that we're all from uh, and Congress blessed this and you know after the war the you know real Virginia quote unquote was in no position for good reason they were in no position to you know try to get this reversed uh, so I think ideally it should be somewhat easier to break up existing states uh, though that would require a constitutional amendment it might be possible to have a deal of some sort where for instance uh, Democrats get to break up California into two or three states, which I think would be a good reform. Uh, it was actually proposed on the, uh, you know, in a, a state referendum in California, but for various legal reasons, California courts kicked that question off the ballot a couple of years ago. Uh, in exchange for breaking up California, which would uh, probably benefit Democrats and give them more Senate seats, uh, perhaps you could do the same thing with Texas, which, uh, depending on how it was divided, that might give Republicans more Senate seats and uh, thereby would, would not change the balance of power in the Senate, but it would uh, enable more foot voting. Uh, but while I think such a thing in principle is possible so far, I've seen very little interest uh, in actually doing this in Congress. Uh, and uh, you know, while there is there are secession movements within the state of California and within a number of other states as well, so far none of them have been successful to the point where uh, they actually have been able to, you know, get the, the state legislature to agree, much less also get Congress to agree. So I think this is, this is a weakness of the uh, U.S. Constitution, uh, but one that may be very hard to fix. Fair enough, and uh, thank you, thank you, Greg, for the question. Um, I want to um, I want to also talk or, or again drive home a little bit more about this discussion about the tensions that get created when people move because. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's obviously people talk a lot, for example, about Californians moving to Texas, right? So it's not just people sorting um, based on, you know, ideological reasons or even for policy reasons, right? It might just be in this case that the economic environment is more favorable for, for uh, certain reasons. And so, um, you know, I think we've all read accounts of, you know, Texas conservative Republicans who are sort of bemoaning that the uh, the liberal Californians are moving to their state and, you know, bringing with them their their preferences for, you know, in this case, you know, maybe more progressive policies. And uh, I, we hear the same kind of argument all the time about, you know, uh, immigrants coming in you know, across the southern border and how this is supposedly very problematic. And so, um, you know, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, to what degree is this is this a risk, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, based on you know what you said earlier, you know, you're probably inclined to to believe that it's it's less problematic than than uh, people typically make it out to be. But um, again, I do I do think there is something to be said there, whether or not you know it's because of the movement itself or because of some sort of backlash. There is this broader question about how to deal with that phenomenon. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you can certainly um, you know blame in this case the the nativists or whatnot for having that kind of reaction, but it does still create a tension. That is um, problematic from a, a public policy standpoint. So I guess the question boils down to it's you know two part or how much of a problem is this really, um, and you know are there things that that could be done to sort of mitigate it to the degree that it exists? Yeah. So. Uh... This is what scholars call the political externalities of immigration or also of internal migration as well, that uh, people might move in, then, you know, they get the right to vote uh, and, you know, they might vote for bad policies or at least different policies than the natives prefer. Uh, and there could be a second type of political externality, which I address in the revised edition, which is the idea that the problem is not that the immigrants are bad voters, it's that natives become worse voters when there are more immigrants. Uh, they vote for e-liberal parties, uh, and in the extreme case, uh, they might uh, you know, overthrow liberal democracy, uh, or as David Frum, the conservative Never Trump political commentator puts it, if liberals don't enforce borders, then fascists will. What he means is that you know, if there's too much migration, fascists will come to power, and that will be horrible. So we have to restrict migration, he and some others argue, uh, in order to protect natives against their own bad impulses that will come out if there's too much migration. Uh, and 
uh, I have a couple different levels of responses to this. Uh, one is that at least when we're talking about uh, immigrants themselves as bad voters, we'll talk about the nativists in a moment, but if we're talking about immigrants themselves as bad voters, this effect is not nearly as great as is often claimed, and this is so for two reasons. Uh, one is when you look at the US, in particular in Canada, to some extent also even many European countries, political preferences, uh, of, of immigrants and natives are actually on most issues are not enormously different. The differences are pretty modest. Uh, one big difference is uh, um, there is big disagreements on immigration itself. Uh, immigrants tend to be more pro-immigrant, though not as much so as I am, but more pro-immigration. Uh, but if that's the issue, then all the right-wing party has to do, uh, if it's the right-wing party is concerned, is shift their position on immigration, and then they would have less reason to worry about uh, immigrants' positions on other issues. Uh, let's push back on that for a second sure. and think about again that 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 intra US right migration right I mean I think yeah. there were I'm going to talk about yeah. that in a sure. moment well the inch on the intra US migration you actually have similar data that the differences are not as great uh for instance there's a recent study of the of the partisan uh, identity of recent interstate migrants to Texas it's almost equally divided between uh, Democrats and Republicans, something like 50% Democrat and 49% Republican, including leaners as uh, you know, leaning to one side or another. So some of those people are actually independents that lean one way. So the impact of migration on political alignments in Texas, at least in recent years, turns out to be very small. Uh, I would add also that even if migrants are skewed towards one party or another to a significant degree. There are other things which mitigate their effects. One is that recent immigrants uh, participate in politics on average much less than natives. And this is also true uh, of recent migrants who just moved to a new state. You can regard this as a bad thing. You know, why aren't they participating more? But if your concern is uh, that they will be bad voters or will vote for the wrong party, you would actually welcome this. They participate, they vote at lower rates. And when you look at other mechanisms of political influence, like activism, campaign contributions, lobbying, and so forth, uh, there the differences are even more striking, both internal and international migrants, at least recent ones, they participate in those sorts of activities at lower rates. This might be a bad thing if you actually welcome the political change immigrants might break, but if you're afraid of it, you should be happy like, yay, these people are coming in and being productive, but they're not actually affecting the political system that much. There is also uh, what scholars call status quo bias, that uh, people other things equal, most people are at least somewhat suspicious of making drastic changes, particularly those who move to a new location precisely because they like it better uh, than the one that they left. Uh, but let's assume that at least in some cases, there is a real threat that migrants will bring lots of political change. Here, we do have keyhole solutions of the type that I talked about in the book. One is one that we actually already use, which is for international migrants, uh, before they can become citizens and have the right to vote, they have to wait at least five years, and they have to pass a civics test that data show about two thirds of native born Americans would fail uh, if they had to take the test without studying. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could make the waiting period longer, you can make the test harder and so forth, and thereby reduce the impact of new migrants uh, on politics. Uh, if you're worried about sort of specific areas of government policy, you can also impose constraints on the overall scope and power of government in those areas. And therefore, uh, if there are constitutional constraints at the state or the federal level, they're much harder to reverse than ordinary policies. Though as we've seen, particularly at the federal level, even reversing ordinary policies is actually quite difficult given bicameralism and the presidential veto uh, and the power of the bureaucracy. Uh, and so forth. Uh, I want to say a brief word on the issue of natives and their reaction to immigration is a different kind of issue. And in some ways, you can might say this is a bigger threat because natives are more numerous than immigrants. They already have the vote. They participate in politics at higher rates uh, and so on. Uh, but here, too, there's reason to doubt the scope of the problem in that unquestionably there are nativist political movements, but it's not clear that they arise simply because 
there is migration above X level, because when you look at survey data and whether people even know how much immigration there is, it turns out that they drastically overestimate how much there is. Uh, and nativists or people hostile to immigration may be particularly likely to overestimate it. So even if, say, you reduce migration at the margin by 10% or 20% or 30%, uh, it doesn't follow that nativists will even notice this, much less you know, change their political allegiances uh, as a result. Uh, so it's not clear that they're actually this problem of nativism really is caused by particular levels of immigration. Indeed, there's data from both the US and Britain that areas with the most nativism actually tend to be ones that have relatively few immigrants there. Uh, so there's much more nativism in you know, say on average, I don't want to say that this is true of everybody who lives there because it's not, but on average, there's more nativism, say in rural Montana, where there are very few immigrants than uh, in Houston, Texas, or in New York City, or uh, Los Angeles, where there's a great many. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, to the extent that this is a problem, there are keyhole solutions. One is that a lot of data does suggest that anti-immigrant sentiment does rise, when it seems like there's disorder at the border, like uh, as we've actually seen over the last year. Uh, so, that the, so the issue is not so much the number of migrants as such, but that it seems chaotic and disorderly and so forth. And you know, people see this on TV and you know, they react negatively to it. Uh, and to the extent that this is a problem and there's some data which suggests that it is, uh, there is an easy keyhole solution. There would be less disorder at the border if legal migration was easier. Uh, that if you said, you, know, you can enter legally and work in the US so long as you check in at a particular checkpoint, the port of entry is the legal lingo for this in the US, then uh, instead of people you know, uh, trying to swim across rivers or being chased by ICE agents on horseback or whatnot, you would see an orderly line setting itself up in front of the checkpoint, people would check the box, you know, present an ID or something, then they would move on. Uh, and this wouldn't look impressive at all on TV. So the TV networks would probably start covering other things and the sense of disorder would be largely dissipated. So ironically, here's an issue where the, a negative, potential negative side effect of migration can actually be dealt with through making uh, migration easier. Uh, in the book, I discuss some other uh, possible keyholes that might address this, uh, but this is the simplest one. Uh, I would add also that this objection, uh, like uh, the objection about migrants being bad voters, and uh, it can be and sometimes is raised even against internal migration. So if you believe that this justifies restrictions on international migration, you, you could believe that it also justifies restrictions on internal migration. And historically, actually, people have made just that argument that you know we can't let Blacks, for instance, move to majority white neighborhoods. That would cause conflict. It would cause backlash. Uh, and also some of these people say, well, Blacks would be bad voters. They have different values from whites. Uh, if that wasn't a good justification for domestic racial segregation, I would argue it also is not a good justification for the, the international kind, which also often falls along racial and ethnic lines, particularly since some, not, some, not all, but some nativist hostility to immigration is in fact based on racial and ethnic prejudice. Uh, and many of the other standard objections to international migration or standard rationales for restricting it, uh, they also, if you take them seriously, would apply to internal migration as well. Yeah, uh, I think that's I think it's a fantastic point. I think that uh, oftentimes people in their minds tend to separate out the sort of uh, uh, you know international arguments from the intranational arguments and. You can sort of reveal how, I mean, again, as you point out, there may be people who who buy into those arguments in both contexts, but I think that a lot of people oftentimes have a different standard for how they view intranational migration from international migration, and uh, you can kind of see how those arguments break down a little bit when you when you put it in that different context. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of, um, I guess, maybe future prospects for for foot voting because, you know, you you talk a lot about this in the in the in the book, but I think there are. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, backlash from both sides of the political aisle to these concepts, right? They've, they've, they've increased. Um, so, you know, on the, on the left, um, maybe the best example is actually Bernie Sanders, right? I, th I think it was in a presidential debate where he, he referred to, you know, opening the borders as a, as a Koch brothers proposal and um, basically implied that it was not um, consistent with, with, you know, his progressive values. Um, and then on the right, there's, of course, you know the 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 rise of of the Trump movement, but I think 
you know, you see this similar, these similar kind of arguments even coming from strange quarters. I mean, you know, there was, as, as one example, I think, you know, Rand Paul uh, made comments about uh, Afghan translators and how, you know, other refugees and so on should stay in Afghanistan and fight for their country and, and you know, not come to the U.S. and, and take advantage of, uh, you know, what we have to offer. And, and um, you know, and I think even made a comparison to the founders in that case that, uh, you know, they, 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 you know, fought for their homeland in a sense, uh, you know, against against England, perhaps ignoring the fact that, you know, their their ancestors were relatively recent immigrants themselves. But um, I do I do wonder what your um, take is on, you know, um, the future of these ideas in a sense. Um, you know, do you think that, um, you know, it, because to some degree that the idea of, you know, freedom of movement or sort of voting with your feet is a very core American idea, right? I mean, this is what everyone associates with the Statue of Liberty and so on, or just on the cover of your book. Um, and so uh, I do, I, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about, you know, what those prospects sure. look like and what you make of this, this um, you know, opposition kind of coming from, from both sides of the political spectrum. So it's a good question. And obviously the political future is difficult to predict, particularly because there could be sudden crises like the COVID pandemic, which few predicted that could affect things. Uh, nonetheless, at least for the moment, I am guardedly optimistic uh, for a couple reasons about with respect to both international migration and internal. The, what, what I should say is that when I say I'm optimistic, I'm not optimistic that things will go as far in this direction as I would like them to go. What I'm optimistic about is that there can be incremental mental improvement. Uh, and that is so for a couple reasons. One is, it's definitely true that nativist political movements have arisen in some ways grown stronger in recent years in both the US and in Europe. On the other hand, if you look at the overall trend of public opinion in the last five, six, seven years, it's actually moved in a more favorable direction with respect to immigration. And strikingly, that happened even during the now year and a half to two years of the COVID crisis. Historically, economic and social crises have been periods when uh, support for immigration diminished uh, because often it's easy to blame migrants for the crisis. And some anti-immigrant movements did in fact try to take advantage of this uh, during the COVID crisis, but so far at least the public opinion data that we have, I discussed some of them in the book, suggest that they were not successful in this in the way that they were during uh, previous moments, though they were successful in the Trump administration in putting in a bunch of uh, unprecedented limits on migration using the COVID crisis as a pretext, uh, which for a time made the U.S more restrictive immigration at any time during its history. But that was not because there was broad political support for this. It was simply because elements within the administration were able to take advantage of the crisis. More generally, the data from both the US and Europe suggests that younger and more highly educated voters uh, are more pro-immigration. Uh, obviously, the proportion of voters who are college graduates is rising over time. And younger voters, people who are young today, will be uh, a larger part of the electorate uh, over time through generational succession. And the data suggests that this is not simply a matter of you're pro-immigration when you're young, but as you get older, you become more hostile. Uh, this is a generational effect rather than what scholars call life cycle effect, where you might have a different view when you're young compared to when you're old. On average, of course, it's not true in every case, but on average, people who have a given attitude towards immigration when they're young, they tend to have a similar attitude you know, when as they age uh, as well. Uh, so this is not something you know, that as you get old, you become crotchety or whatever, and you know, your views might change. Uh, your views as a young person are, tend to be significantly predictive of your views uh, when you're older. On the domestic side, uh, I think there's also some reason to be optimistic about foot voting possibilities and that one of the biggest obstacles to domestic foot voting in the US is exclusionary zoning, uh, which makes it very difficult to uh, um, build new housing in response to demand in many areas. And if there's no housing available or very little, people can't vote with their feet for that area. Uh, this is a very serious problem, but there is reforms underway in a number of states, including California, which has some of the worst zoning restrictions, but their state legislature recently passed two bills, which are reforms. New York is another particularly egregious offender, but the new governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, who came to power because of the 
uh, you know, the scandals that Andrew Cuomo had, she actually has announced uh, a pretty extensive agenda of housing reforms has won praise uh, from right of center experts on this area, as well as some on the left. I don't know for sure if she can implement those initiatives, but, uh, you know, I don't know if she'll be successful, but the very fact that she's announced them is itself a good sign. There's also uh, reforms underway in a number of states on uh, restrictive occupational licensing, which is also a major barrier uh, to freedom of movement within the US. Uh, so I'm optimistic on that front. I'm less optimistic on the front of decentralizing power from the center from the federal government, which sadly, uh, obviously the Biden administration wants to centralize much more than it wants to decentralize. And this is also true uh, for many Republicans as well, at least when there's a Republican president in the White House, when they become more enthusiastic about uh, more federal spending, even though they don't like it as much when, you know, there's a Democrat in the White House. So that particular side, I'm, you know, I'm less optimistic about. It is true uh, that, uh, you know, there's anti-immigration elements in both sides of the political spectrum. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm no fan of Bernie Sanders. I think he's generally awful. On the other hand, the attitudes you mentioned are ones that he had to pull back on when he ran in a Democratic primaries, both in 2016 and 2020. Uh, what he said, the quote you made, you cited is not actually from a presidential debate. It's from an interview with the Vox uh, website, which he did in 2015, when he was actually in presidential debates. Uh, he talked a different game. Perhaps he was dis being deceptive about his true views, but the fact that he felt he had to be deceptive is a sign of where the Democratic Party, at least its base, is moving on this. The, De the Republican Party, sadly, in my view, is moving in a different direction. And, you know, I'm not optimistic about that in the short run, but in the long run, uh, generational succession can have an impact uh, there as well, younger and more highly educated Republicans also tend to be more pro-immigration or at least less anti-immigration than their elders, as is also true on the Democratic side, right? perhaps even more true on the Democratic side. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think the, the point about uh, housing and, and zoning and is, is also very, very important. I think the the, the rise of maybe the, the YIMBY movement, I think, is a, a, you know, a very important development. Um, I, I guess this leads into, you know, we're running sh short on time, so I'll ask one last question of you, and it's, um, it's basically a question about whether or not foot voting can be effective at lasting change or really substantial change. I think that, you know, it's obvious that, you know, you can express your preferences by moving from one location to another. Um, but I wonder about how feasible that is in any sort of, you know, en masse or in any sort of coordinated sense. Um, you know, and I think, I mean, on an individual level, um, you know, I think there are a lot of factors that determine where one chooses to live. And, you know, those policy, you know, the policies that you live under are but one of them. You know, that some live in California for the climate or, uh, you know, or that you, you care about where your family's from or, or currently lives or quality of schools and as you said, you know, job opportunities and this sort of thing. So, um, so you can have places that of course can have superior policies. Um, more likely, you know, they're going to be superior in some ways and, and inferior in others from, from, you know, a given person's perspective. And so um, I just wonder if it's, you know, really feasible over the long term to, um, you know, have movement or, or foot voting really be a feasible mechanism, I guess, to, to bring about really significant changes on the scale that a lot of people, you know, typically want to see. So uh, maybe we can kind of close on that on what I assume will be a uh, an optimistic note. Sure. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there's two issues there. One is you can say, well, many foot voting decisions are not really about political uh, choice or public policy. Uh, they might be about things like job opportunities, housing costs, and so on. Uh, and that's true to some extent, but many of these other things actually are heavily influenced by policy. Job opportunities certainly are, housing is, uh, and so on. And so I think those are uh, aspects of political choice, even if in the mind of the person making a decision, uh, you know, the, the first order concern is about economics or about housing or something else, uh, still you're choosing 
uh, you know, a, a, a better government policy. And that in turn leads to a broader point about, you know, does this affect waxing change? You know, will government policy actually improve? And I would answer that at two levels. One is, let's say, no government policies change at all. Uh, people move around, but in response, the government just do what they're doing before. Still, uh, the more uh, people are free to vote with their feet, the higher the percentage of people that will get to live in countries or in jurisdictions in a federal system uh, where the policies are actually beneficial to them. So even though the quality of government as measured by uh, the percentage of territory, which is covered by a quote unquote good government, that might not change. The quality of government as experienced by people does change in that more people will live under good governments or at least relatively good governments than before. And what we should care about ultimately is the quality of government experienced by people rather than you know by places uh, divorced from people. Second, uh, a second level answer to that is that uh, Obviously, we can structure federal systems and other government institutions in ways that give governments an incentive to seek out foot voters uh, and to make themselves more attractive. I already mentioned one, if governments have to raise their own tax revenue, as opposed to getting money from a higher level of government uh, or from international aid assistance or whatnot, uh, then they have an incentive to attract foot voters and to keep uh, uh, incentivize people not to leave, and that can improve the quality of government over time. And, you know, there's some evidence of this over U.S. history. Uh, so uh, we can make institutional adjustments to uh, push for further improvements. Uh, and, you know, will this lead to radical drastic change? I'm not sure, and I think most likely probably won't lead to drastic change in the actual ensemble of policies that particular governments have there, it might lead at most to incremental improvement, but it can lead to drastic change in terms of the percentage of the world's people that live under governments that are at least reasonably good, as opposed to ones that are truly horrendous. And within the United States and other more advanced nations, a higher percentage of people uh, will live under relatively good state or local governments compared to relatively bad ones. And I would add that if you decentralize some decisions all the way to the private sector, often people can improve their situation without physically moving. Uh, a dramatic example is school choice, where you could potentially send your kids to a vastly better school, which might even have life transforming effects, uh, but that you, know, you don't even have to physically move uh, to a different house or a different locality uh, to make that happen. So I think there could be radical change in terms of the quality of government actually experienced by most people, even if uh, you know, there might not be more than relatively modest change in the policies that any given government adopts. Uh, but, if that, but if a government is really bad, uh, at least its harmful effects are diminished, the fewer the number of people who have to put up with it. And foot voting opportunities uh, is the best way I know of to uh, getting to that point. It's a great point, and it's a, a great optimistic note to uh, to end on. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Ilya, for, for joining us today. I think it was a great discussion. I think these are really uh, powerful and important ideas, and there's uh, a lot to uh, to take away in terms of what, uh, you know, maybe more creative ways of thinking about uh, solutions to some of the, the governance problems that, we, that we've had at all levels of government. So um, I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who tuned in, and uh, look forward to, uh, to, to joining you all next time. So uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for having me.